Noam Chomsky helps us answer the big question, why does the United States seem driven to create an empire? Welcome to the Henry A. Wallace National Security Forum. I'm Sonali Kohatkar. Many Americans are not accustomed to the idea that our country sits at the top of a global empire. But with military bases in dozens of countries, interventions in other countries' political processes, and all-out invasions, there's no other word to describe our trajectory. But why are we so prone to empire building? Joining me to answer that question is renowned author, linguist, and political commentator, Professor Noam Chomsky. Welcome to the program. Glad to be with you. Where do you think the U.S.'s aspirations for empire come from? Is it the nature of any state to uh, pursue military domination, or do you think there's something specific to U.S. history that this uh, country is particularly uh, prone to imperialism because of? A good explanation of it was given by uh, uh, John Lewis Gaddis. Uh, expansion is the path to security. If you want to be secure, you have to control everything else. The uh, commitment to empire goes back to the original colonization. By the Second World War, uh, the United States was in a position of unprecedented power. At the end of the Second World War, the U.S. literally had half the world's wealth. The tacit assumption was we own the world. Uh, you can see this very clearly in what happened as soon as this system of power began to erode, and that happened very quickly. In 1949, uh, China became independent. Uh, there's a name for that in American political history. It's called the loss of China. Uh, the phrase loss of China uh, expresses the tacit assumption that basically we own China, and if it moves to independence, we've lost it. And uh, since we own most of the world in this sense, we have to defend it, so we have to have a thousand military bases, uh, military forces almost as uh, great as the rest of the world combined, and it runs right through American history. This fear of everything is pervasive. It goes back to the origins of the society. It's related to the imperial thrust of, as Gaddis put it, uh, attaining uh, security through expansion. And that's uh, limitless, essentially. So that's the imperial thrust. It's not unique to the United States. It's uh, developed in an extreme form here, but that's because of uh, extraordinary U.S. Uh, wealth and power. Uh, how intertwined is m corporatism and the drive for profit with our militarism? Is it always the case that, that the drive for access to resources tends to drive our uh, militarism? Well, if you look, take a look through history again, in the 19th century, the major commodity uh, the equivalent of oil today was cotton. Uh, that was the source of the Industrial Revolution. Jacksonian uh, presidents in the mid-19th century uh, explained very clearly that they wanted to uh, conquer Texas and a large part of Mexico, approximately half, in order to try to gain a monopoly over cotton. Uh, President Polk said, pointed, said that uh, that would bring England to our feet by uh, gaining a monopoly of the major uh, commodity in the world, cotton. Move on a few years, uh, oil becomes the major commodity. And incidentally, it's not a matter of primarily of access to oil. Uh, during the whole period when the U.S. was the major producer and didn't need access to the oil, its policies were the same. The issue was control over oil, not access. And there was a reason for that. When the U.S. invaded Iraq in 2003, Zbigniew Brzezinski said if it works, it'll be very good because controlling Iraqi oil and uh, increasing our control over Middle East oil will give us what he called critical leverage over uh, Europe and other industrial powers. We'll be in a position to hold the spigot. I've just talked about two of the major commodities. You look at others, and it's, you get pretty much the same story. 
Now, you've written a lot about mass media and how it is uh, you know, often used to manufacture consent from the U.S. public for things like war and strengthening U.S. empire. But today we have a significantly changed media landscape, at least it seems so. And I'm wondering if you feel that we as citizens are still prone to the, the kind of brainwashing that we once were. Uh, people are deluged with a single message. We're defending ourselves. So uh, uh, take a look at the, the invasion of Iraq, let's say. Uh, Barack Obama is considered a critic, but notice his grounds. Not that aggression is wrong, not that destruction of a society by violence is wrong. It's that it was a blunder. So that implies that if the aggression and violence had succeeded, expanding our control over uh, the, the one of the major resources, the contemporary world, uh, giving us critical leverage over our rivals, then it wouldn't have been stupid, would have been fine. Uh, that's called criticism. The worst criticism that can be made within the mainstream of US policy is it was a mistake. Now, these are the standard views of uh, what are called statesmen, uh, people who are committed to uh, defending and expanding uh, powerful interests, uh, powerful dominant domestic interests. Uh, and uh, that leads to the thrust for empire and the justification of that thrust as defensive. Now going back to the population, it is submerged in uh, doctrinal uh, pronouncements of this kind. Uh, when enemies do it, we call it propaganda. Uh, when we do it, we call it education. Uh, but it's not very different. But an isolated individual uh, faced with this deluge of uh, uh, propaganda, of uh, doctrinal uniformity, does have a difficult time extricating himself or herself from it. Finally, Professor Chomsky, many have predicted that the U.S. empire may be waning, that we're in the sort of twilight of empire phase. Do you have any sense that that might actually be true? Uh, there has certainly been decline from the high point of power, which was 1945. But as I mentioned, that decline began right away in late 1949 a large part of the empire was lost. Uh, there was immediate concern that Southeast Asia might be lost. That's the origins of the Vietnam War. Uh, it's concerns over Latin America, the Middle East. Uh, in the last decade, uh, South America has become, has gained substantial independence. Uh, by now they're very free from U.S. domination. Uh, it's an enormous change. Uh, that's uh, the loss of South America, if you like it. So sure, the process of uh, decline goes on, continues, uh, waxes and wanes. It's not a steady process, but there is a tendency for power to become more diffused. Uh, but the United States is still overwhelming in many dimensions, crucially in the dimension of violence. Uh, the U.S. is far ahead of anyone else in uh, military bases, military technology, uh, far more advanced than anywhere, uh, and uh, uh, even simple military spending. As I said, it's almost as much as the rest of the world combined. So empire is a complex affair. Yes, there's a decline, began in the 1940s, it's continuing, uh, but has by no means abated. Professor Chomsky, thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> On the next episode of the Henry A. Wallace National Security Forum, we'll talk to activist and author Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz about how the U.S. uses its experience of occupying indigenous people's lands in its effort to dominate other countries overseas. So the imperialist um, urge was there from the beginning and it got institutionalized. It's the, it's the core makeup of the U.S. Army today and in almost every situation.